Welcome everybody to Coastal Insights, our online learning series designed to help you improve your understanding of coastal British Columbia and hopefully it'll help you gain new perspective on where we live. So my name is Maureen Vo and I am joining you today live from the unceded traditional territory of the Kwakwakiwak First Nations here on the very northern tip of Vancouver Island. So just to get a sense of where everyone is joining from, I'd love everyone to just type in the chat box that you see below where you're located today and where you're, you're casting in from. So I know lots of people are from Sydney, a lot of people from the island, Margaret from all the way in Quebec. So welcome today. And we're excited to launch our episode two in this online learning series. So if you missed episode one, and you wanna catch any of these episodes later on, we're going to be recording them and uploading them up to on our website, which I will share with you at the end of today's episode. And so each week we're going to be launching a new fun and interactive video on a topic of Coastal British Columbia. We have a great lineup of feature panelists and speakers who will be sharing with you their work their stories and the many ways that they are helping to protect and sustain this coastline. And so today's episode, I'm very excited to introduce to you. Um, so we all know today in our urban environments, the populations are growing and expanding. And also our human curiosities often lead us to different wild places and spaces. And sometimes this can lead to an overlap in boundaries and habitats with our wildlife neighbors. So to speak more on that topic of today, um, we're going to be looking at relationships between humans and wildlife. And I'd like to introduce to you our feature presenter for today. She is our Raincoast Conservation Foundation Research Fellow. She's a PhD student at the University of Victoria in Raincoast's very own Applied Conservation Science Lab. And she's also a National Geographic Explorer and all around powerhouse. I introduce you, Lauren Eckhart. Thanks so much, Mo. I'm, I'm really, really grateful to be here today with you all virtually. It's awesome to have opportunities to connect like this while we're, we're all isolating. It's a great way to stay feeling connected. And I'm really excited to share with you just a little bit of insight into my research as a, a Raincoast Conservation Fellow and a PhD student into conflict, human wildlife conflict, but also on a larger scale into coexistence and relationships. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully this all goes off without a hitch. And oh, from the beginning, maybe. There we go. How are we doing? Can I get a, a, a thumbs up if we're doing okay? Everybody can see my screen. Awesome. Okay. So, as I said, I'm going to talk to you today about human wildlife relationships. And, and I want to talk to you about that towards understanding conflict and working together towards coexistence with each other and also with wildlife. So, my broader PhD research actually um, looks at conservation conflict transformation, which is a body of theory that looks at ways to acknowledge conflict and not just its superficial clashes but also the deep-rooted drivers of that conflict, things like human values and beliefs and habitat destruction um, on the wildlife side of conflict. And, and so I'll skip the introduction. Uh, Mo has done a great job in, in sharing a little bit about what I do, but I, I'll note that I'll have my contact information up at the end as well, and I'd love to hear from anyone who wants to follow up or has additional questions that don't get answered today. And so, of course, I'll also begin with the territorial acknowledgement. It was great to see where people were from and how many people were acknowledging the Indigenous territories um, that they were, they were joining from today. So I join you from Victoria in my little home office. Um, that is also my bedroom. And I am on the territories of the Wasanich, Lekwungen, and Foggy nations, the Coast Salish nations, as they are often known. And the research I'm going to share with you today is uh, slated to occur in Powell River, British Columbia, the territories of the Tla'aman Nation, sometimes known as the Tla'aman Nation. And I want to make sure not to tokenize that territorial acknowledgement, um, but to make clear here that the benefits 
that I, m I myself have received inadvertently from violent colonization of indigenous peoples, myself speaking as a, as a settler, a settler scholar, are part of what drives me um, to do work in a broad number of ways that works towards promoting um, decolonial methods, methods that are in partnership with indigenous nations or to engage in work led by indigenous nations. So when thinking about human wildlife conflict, I think it's really, really important to recognize that there are any number of individuals and nations globally that have much longer um, and more sustained relationships with wildlife that settler communities are coming into conflict with more and more, especially in, in urban landscapes, as Mo described. And if anyone is interested in this resources map that I'm sharing today, that link is up on the top and I'll make sure Mo is able to send it out for you. I can drop it in chat as well if anyone wants to follow up with that. And so I have long been on the path uh, towards caring about wildlife and I think towards wildlife conservation work. I think really often about what made this tiny Lauren so interested at such an early age in understanding and thinking about and contemplating wildlife and caring so much about them that I wanted to dress up as them all the time. Um, and and it, it has led me to explore sort of what stories, what values, what beliefs drive my decision making and my values towards wildlife and the natural world, but also in other people who have conflicting opinions to my own, what early values and beliefs similarly drive their decisions and their motivations as they relate to their world and to wildlife. So before launching into talking about humans and black bears and human and wildlife relationships, conflict, coexistence, I want to take a moment to talk about that word relationship. Um, in the Western context, in a, in a settler world in post-colonial Canada, we often uh, use the word relationship to refer to those relationships we have with other people. Um, and rarely is the word relationship come into play when we talk about the natural world or wildlife in our backyard. And when it does, it historically and even now still typically is often considered a relationship of either domination or humans are attempting to dominate and, and develop landscapes or of separatism where we're removed from the relationships of the natural world, of natural ecosystems. And I want to take a moment to recognize that in an Indigenous theory, in Indigenous praxis, there's a really different lens to look at the term relationship. And in that context, relationship is, is much more broadly defined to include the interconnectivity between relationships between everything, non-living things, non-human animals and animals. And that opposed to sort of Western traditions of looking at nature. There are all of these alternative um, and indigenous theories which look at relationships in a really, really different light and really consider how interrelated we are with everything else and how important reciprocity and respect is in building those relationships. And I think that's all really important to think about in the context of thinking about humans and wildlife. So today I'm going to hone in and focus on relationships between humans and wildlife, but particularly between black bears and humans in British Columbia. And um, it was a truly incredible introduction, Johanna, to, to hear that there was a black bear on a porch. Um, I was giving this presentation, a version of it, to a fourth grade classroom in Chicago last week. And it was an entirely different experience and different um, introduction because just to get the kids thinking about the reality that some people have black bears in their yards was a huge hurdle to jump. There are many places in the world where the relationship between humans and bears is much more abstracted, it's hard to imagine, relative to our experiences here in British Columbia. Um, and, and so I want to prime you guys a little bit on thinking about your relationship with bears. Some of you may be more recent and potent than for others. Um, but I, I'd love to get get to some of that in the chat after the short presentation or in the Q&A about how we relate to, to bears, how our past experiences how have informed how we think about bears and what our emotions are towards bears, because many of us have had really direct experience with them or expect to sort of every year. Uh, and so when we think about bears and humans and our relationship in sort of a scientific context, 
the broad scientific research that has considered why human and bear conflict occurs looks at a couple of really key things that we'll focus on today. And the scientific literature call those things predictors, but they're sort of just environmental variables, things in our environment, in our life, that may lead to conflict or may lead to coexistence. So those are things like habitat, homes of bears, forests, intact forests, and habitat of human, our, our homes, our built homes, our built spaces. Um, and so other predictors, other variables in the environment that are important to consider uh, is our behavior. So things like garbage cans, whether or not we're putting out garbage cans and whether we're managing the attractants that make bears come into our yard. Food availability for bears. Sometimes food availability, even natural food like berries, ends up in our yard. Uh, and that's also going to increase the likelihood that bears and people end up in conflict. So these are typically the sort of variables that scientists look at when they end up in an urban or rural environment and say, okay, what here can help us predict whether there's going to be conflict or coexistence between people and bears? And these variables can lead to really, really different outcomes with bears, which many of you have, have probably witnessed or at least familiar with. So this image I've pulled up is, as you can see, two black bear cubs happily going at it at a bird feeder. And while some people, particularly this class I was chatting with, this Chicago class, you know, love this image and thought it was is so cute, and, and in many ways it is, um, but what, what this image spells is problem for these two black bear cubs who have now been conditioned to rely on food in the backyard of a person who may or may not tolerate them doing that and who may or may not live there forever. So even if the people living in this home have a good relationship with those black bears, the next people who live in that home may not or their neighbors may not. And so this other image shows black bear cubs similarly, but on their own in the wild. And while we think about good relationships between people typically means we're interacting with people a lot we're kind and positive towards one another. In a wildlife context, it often means giving bears as much space as we can and letting bears know that it's not okay for them to be in our backyards because of reasons outside of our control by limiting those attractants like bird feeders or garbage or berry bushes. And so coming back to thinking about these relationships and the variables that can drive conflict. As a scientist, I wanna know how can I better understand how these variables, food availability, habitats, homes, people, bears, behavior, how they are ending up in different outcomes and conflict outcomes or coexistent outcomes, and what tools we can use to better predict where those outcomes will come to play and how we can educate people to avoid those outcomes. And so there are two ways that I'm aiming to do that, that I was planning to do that actually right now in the field but I'm not currently doing that, of course, because of COVID-19. It's not safe for me to travel and be in the field. Um, and those two ways to do that as a scientist are talking to people, social science, doing interviews and surveys with folks to understand their experiences with bears, how they value them, what they've seen, what they want out of a relationship with bears. And then also getting information from bears through safe, distant observations. So things like camera traps, videos and photos of bears, and looking for bear signs like uh, paw prints or a scat. And so my goal with this research that I'm now engaging in distantly, but will eventually engage in on the ground, is to use these ecology tools, things like camera traps to look at nosy bears, but also to go up and talk to people, to gain insight into their worlds, their lives, their experiences. And so combining these two really powerful types of science, social and ecological science, can give us a better picture of these relationships that are embedded both in people's experiences and in the environment, which are both really deeply intertwined. And so it turns out when you really start talking to people and observing bears, that the relationship between bears and humans and whether that relationship results in conflict or coexistence is actually really complicated. So things like humans' beliefs, our opinions about policy or how bears should be managed or whether bears are good or bad or dangerous or safe come into play. Our emotions, fear, happiness, excitement, 
or past experiences, property damage right there, or a really wonderful time we saw a cub and a mom in the wild safely. Our values, whether we deeply relate to wildlife or see it as something to keep far away from us. And our perception of risk, how worried we are about our bears hurting ourselves, our kids, our pets, or maybe just eating our food. And bears also are complicated too, right? As living beings, bears have different behavior based on how old they are, whether they have cubs, whether they're male or female. They have different behaviors based on how accessible wild food is to them. So if it's a year that there isn't enough fish or berries or other foraging food for bears, they're more likely to engage in risky behavior. Proximity to habitat. How accessible is a home where they don't have to interact with people? If their habitat is really patchy, if they just have patches of forest to live in, it's quite likely that that bear is more likely to run into people really early. All of these things together in the health of the bear, so whether the bear is, is, is full um, or starving and willing to take risks, together all of these things end up creating these shared experiences where a bear engages in behavior and a person engages in certain behavior. And between those two behaviors, we have our outcome. So whereas science sort of historically, Western science thought about conflict just in terms of behavior, it's now starting to try and get into the deep roots. How can we explain this behavior? And by explaining that behavior, we have, hopefully we're heading towards more complicated, more nuanced, um, more effective ways to educate people about how to avoid conflict with bears and also to manage habitat so that bears are less likely to come into conflict with people. And by doing so, hopefully we can promote coexistence in the long term. So wildlife relationships are of course not exclusive to humans and black bears, though by the sounds that many of you on the call have ongoing relationships with black bears. But the same drivers apply to all sorts of animals we live near and even with. So last week, Nathan was um, telling me that he assigned you guys the challenge of taking photos to ID local animals or just trying to ID local animals. And my challenge for this week is going to be a request that you look closely at the wildlife in your own backyard. Wildlife we may not often consider wildlife to the same degree that we consider things like bears or cougars or other large animals. Deer, rabbits, squirrels, raccoons, mice, coyotes, cougars, elk, birds, birds of prey, and songbirds. They all fill our yards, and I think now more than ever, sitting at home, we're observing them more frequently and realizing just how many small living things are in our, our immediate vicinity. And so my challenge to you guys is to not just record these animals by species, but also record your observations of local wildlife and to think more deeply about your relationship to them. How are your identities tied up in one another? Do you have a positive relationship? Are you reliant on each other? Um, as an example, yesterday I was sitting at our lunch table and I looked out the back door and there was this little female finch um, and she was pulling at our doormat, which has sort of a stringy straw material in it. And it was clear she was harvesting it for her her nest that she was building. Um, and that struck me as a really interesting interrelationship that I had and that Finch had that at the moment felt mutually beneficial. I was getting a ton of joy from that connection to that little bird and watching its behavior. And she was getting access to materials to build her nest. But I had to wonder in a world where um, I wasn't aware of that relationship, what it, what it might look like. So you can do this in any number of ways by taking field notes, photos, videos, by writing poetry, drawing. But I encourage you all to think really deeply about even what may seem like menial relationships um, with animals in your backyard. And so finally, I, I just want to take a quick moment as I wrap up to reflect not just on the local level relationships, the relationships we have with black bears or with finches on our back porch, but also to think about that word relationship with wildlife on the global stage right now. Um, we're all living in a really strange, unprecedented moment where the importance of a good relationship with wildlife has never been so clear. We are all so connected, humans and humans by our health, but also humans and non-human animals, wildlife. COVID-19 is partially a result of a really poor and strained relationship with wildlife, of, of habitat destruction 
and mistreatment of wildlife and other animals that led to unsustainable exploitation and housing conditions. And so this moment calls upon all of us to not just think about our relationship to the wildlife near us, but our whole society's relationship to animals. And I think it calls on a recognition that our health really all is deeply interconnected. Um, and so hopefully this is a moment to reflect on that and move forward in, in bolder, better relationship ways as, as we move forward after this. And yeah, with that, I'll, I'll wrap it up. I'll share my contact information. I've lost my Q&A box, but I think it'll come back up when I, um, when I stop sharing my screen. And I'm happy to, to hear from you guys if you have, have feedback or emails or questions. I'm happy to answer some questions today. So thank you all again. I'm going to go ahead and stop the screen share. Come back to my normal screen. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Lauren, for sharing your insight on coexistence with wildlife. It really, hopefully, it makes people look at all the different creatures that we share this earth with and think twice about how we navigate through this world together. So thank you for that excellent presentation. Um, so now, as with every live and interactive video that we do, we're going to open up the floor to you, the attendees to ask questions um, of our future presenter. And so you can ask in the Q&A box. So if everyone looks down at your options down below, um, there's a Q&A box and you can type in your question there. Or if you want, you can type it in the chat box where everyone can see as well. So I'm just gonna open it up here. And then Lauren as well, you can check the chat box for any sure. questions. Um, and feel free to ask whatever questions, if they're not specific to human wildlife relationships, you know, about science or, or research or anything you may have questions about, I'm all ears. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for some reason during uh, the presentation, my, my, my screen had a little glitch, so I had to switch screens. So hopefully I can see everything. Um, okay, so there's a question from Lisa Lee. Would bees count as wildlife for my observations? Totally, absolutely. I think the cool thing about thinking about wildlife is, is thinking about interconnectivity and bees are a great animal that are an awesome example of interconnectivity. Bees are so critically important to all of us living things, right? Anything that relies on plants and the plants themselves rely on bees. Bees are also an interesting conservation topic because we know they're threatened by any number of things and they're also threatened by other species of, of bugs and so thinking about interconnectivity of bees as pollinators but also as prey and as things that are impacted by um, contaminants in our world that they're great wildlife to think about. Awesome great question. Okay, so there's a question from Sophia. If we see a conflict between animals, do we or should we interfere? For example, be caught in a spider's web. That's a really, really good question, Sophia. Um, and maybe a tricky one to answer. So my initial instinct to answer would be no. In most cases where there's conflict between animals, for example, a bee caught in a spider's web, um, I would say, according to my philosophy, <laughs> that is something to, to let happen. Spiders are also really important part of global ecology and our local ecology and our world, and they have to eat. So bees, as we've talked about, they're not just um, pollinators, but they're also prey. They're really important for some animals to eat. And so in that context, I would not interfere. If I saw, you know, two male deer sort of barring across the street. That wouldn't be something to interfere with. We have to respect that not only do we have relationships to wild animals, but wild animals have relationships with each other. And that's not necessarily our realm to interfere with if we can avoid interfering with it. And then there are some times where we see wildlife in distress that is appropriate for us to interfere. So for instance, you see a neighborhood cat eating a songbird. To me, that's something that we can um, take a step and interfere with because that's sort of more in our vein of our relationship to that wildlife. Um, something really important to be aware of this time of year is that a lot of baby animals are out and about and sometimes people unintentionally interfere with young animals like fawns, baby deer. Their mamas will leave them 
as they go out and forage. And often people think the deer are lost, so they'll like pick them up and interfere and, and want to bring them, you know, into the home to be safe. So I just remember that it kind of depends on context when it comes to having sort of like an actual physical relationship with wildlife. Most of the time we want to avoid it. There are some circumstances in which we can ask professionals, so like local wildlife re rehabilitation officers, to help us where an animal has been negatively impacted or is hurt by a human. But animal and animal conflict is sort of their relationship to work out, I would say. So it's kind of a long answer, but yeah. Good advice. Okay, the next question comes from Mar. So what sort of effective action do you propose we can take? The mm. killing of our beloved Takaya still stings deeply, so as well as all other trophy hunting. This is a really um, profound question in, in some ways, and I don't unfortunately think it has a really good straightforward answer. Um, so Rain Coast Conservation Foundation, of course, as you know, does a, a ton of work um, to end trophy hunting on sort of both ethical and ecological grounds. That trophy hunting isn't a sustainable practice, and it also doesn't reflect well on our society's relationship with wildlife. Um, and when, so part of my research is about human values and understanding how societal values shift. And while primarily in the US and Canada 50 years ago, the settler value was associated towards using wildlife as sort of um, resource, that has shifted a lot in the last 50 years to be more of this value of mutualism, which in, in non-sciencey flim flam terms means focus on relationship and reciprocity between wildlife, the recognition that wildlife live their own lives that, and aren't just resources for human consumption. But I think that change is taking a long time to percolate into policy. And so I think in terms of effective action that we can take to improve our relationship with wildlife and policy about wildlife, about things like trophy hunting, the best we can do is enact our values in our day-to-day -day life be really clear about what our relationship with wildlife is and why we respect wildlife. And also to share that value with other people, to be willing to have conversations about why you think it's inappropriate to kill wolves for trophies or to kill bears for trophies. And to, to put our sort of our, our walk where our talk is. So to support organizations like Rain Coast and to show up to vote when we're old enough to um, for individuals that reflect our environmental and, and wildlife values. So not maybe <laughs> a really compelling answer because it takes a lot of time and that can be really hard, but there are things you can do in your day-to-day -day life to support wildlife. And while it might not save every wolf like Takaya, it, it can make small changes. Less plastic, right? Like small daily things, small sustainable practices might not directly help the problems we face, like black bear or wolf hunting, but it can make changes for other wildlife, even if we're not interacting them with, with them every day. So there are a million little things you can do. They're not always the most gratifying things, but they matter a lot. Mm -hmm, for sure. Um, this question comes from Fernando. What made you decide to study the interaction in between humans and wildlife? Mm -hmm. What was the most important thing that you learned so far? These are really good questions, you guys. <laughs> And, and hard to answer succinctly. Um, so I, as I mentioned, as a child, I was pretty obsessive about wildlife until I was about nine years old. I think my parents were actually a little worried that I would never accept that I was a human because I would always play pretending that I was an animal. I was fascinated by, by wildlife. And I'm not quite sure where that comes from. I think it comes a little bit from stories, a lot from watching National Geographic, like cheetah documentaries when I was five years old. A little from the Lion King, who knows exactly. Um, but for my undergraduate degree, so my, my first sort of foray into science, I was studying environmental sciences, so biology. I wanted to go out, I wanted to observe animals, I wanted to collect data about them. And I thought that was for me the way to, to get towards a, a career in conservation. But what I realized really quickly is if you discount the importance of humans' relationship with wildlife. And if you discount 
the value of the knowledge systems of Indigenous peoples or the value of Indigenous-led conservation or, you know, folks who are locally involved in conservation efforts. You're sort of missing a key piece of the conservation movement. Conservation, at the end of the day, is about people. It's about changing people's behaviors. The environment, while we're in a reciprocal relationship with it, it, it will fix itself if we allow it to in, in many ways. Like biodiversity can uphold itself if we can change people's relationship and behavior. So I think it was through working on a lot of projects where we were just collecting ecology data, like just collecting information about how many monkeys there were, what these mice ate, I realized that we were really missing it, that the sort of active piece of the conservation puzzle, which is if we want to save the species we care about, we have to understand people and we have to change behaviors and policies. Um, the most important thing I've learned so far, I think is, is I mean, that's a really hard <laughs> question to answer. I, I've been really humbled. I've been able to work on projects that were led by Central Coast First Nations. And what I've learned from that work is, is that structures, policies, alternative relationships than the one Western society has with nature and wildlife right now exist. Um, and that we as settler scholars need to look towards Indigenous peoples and nations as leaders in redefining our relationship with wildlife. And, and that is possible, like that it is not the status quo for humans to treat wildlife poorly. That is just one version of a relationship and there are better alternatives. So yeah, I would say that's one really important thing I've learned. Nice. Yeah, it's always interesting to learn about how people arrived to where they are and, and what they're doing today. Totally. Um, I'm going to go to this question. What's Raincoast's plan after this pandemic for wildlife conservation? Well, <laughs> you have the answer to that question. It's a really good one. Oh, that's, a, that's a really good question. And so, I mean, Raincoast is dedicated to focusing on lots of different species and habitats throughout the coast of BC. And so we're going to be continuing. We are, we are still doing it and we'll continue that even after the pandemic. And so our work ranges from the lower mainland, we're doing lots of work in the lower Fraser with wild salmon, up into the Great Bear Rainforest studying grizzlies in their habitats. Um, and so all of the flagship projects that we are currently studying, we will still continue to focus on and um, get more outreach and community engagement and get information out there as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And I'll just speak for myself. I mean, as a Raincoast fellow and, and a PhD student and say that um, I'm taking the time right now to sort of pivot. I'm trying to take a lot of the conversations, the surveys I wanted to do with people online, to do online surveys, to, to continue the work even though we're apart. Um, and I'm really grateful for the people who have been willing to engage in those. And I, I was sort of on the path already towards moving away from just thinking about collecting data about animals and towards understanding people better. And this moment in so many ways emphasizes the importance of, of doing that, of um, even if we love animals and want to be in nature all the Lauren, time. Yeah. We can't hear you. Oh, no. <laughs> you guys hear Lauren still? Or maybe it's just me. Oh, they could. Maybe oh, you can't hear me. Oh, weird. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> Sorry, this is my connection. Okay, my bad. Continue. Um, yeah, so anyway, I was just saying that I think um, while I'm not working as much as I want to be right now because it's a global pandemic and things are hard um, and I'm really lucky to be at home and to be able to continue my work, I definitely think that this is motivating me to, to look even deeper into just the interconnectedness of everything, right? That, and to look for opportunities to, to um, talk to people about alternative relationships that we can have with wildlife and with each other. Because uh, I don't think everyone realizes that this, this isn't the way we have to operate, that the way we treat wildlife isn't the way things have to be. So I think this is a, a loud call to, to look at different options because it's not sustainable the way we're doing it now. So, yeah. Awesome. 
Okay, there are a lot of questions, so I'm sorry if I missed any of your questions. I'll take this one from the, the chat box. I don't know, Lauren, if you might be able to answer this or not. So there, last week we kind of introduced people to coastal British Columbia, and so it looks like Jolie's question. Um, last week you downloaded the Merlin app and found out it was, oh, sorry, download the Merlin app and found out it was a northern pygmy owl. So you saw northern pygmy owl. We have a mixed hemlock and old growth Douglas fir forest that has been flagged with road location for future logging. Is this an endangered bird that potentially could save that forest? This might be a question for someone who does Endangered Species Risk Act research explicitly. I do some environmental policy work, but I mostly do research on the environmental assessment processes, which decide sort of outcomes on things like uh, the Coastal Gas Link project, like large scale industrial projects and actually are under separate legislation from forestry stuff, which is all to say this might be a question to redirect elsewhere at Rain Coast, um, but I'm happy to look into it. I'm gonna write a note to myself. But yeah, I, I don't know either if the Northern Pygmy Owl is in, endangered to a point that it receives the sort of sweeping habitat protection um, that hyper endangered species fall over nor if that is applicable in Canada right now. I know in the US they have sort of sweeping measures when certain endangered species are found to protect habitat. But I do want to point out that that idea of we often call them umbrella species. So several species of key conservation concern can serve when if you locate them in local habitat can serve as a way to protect a whole ecosystem. So the Short answer is I don't know, and the longer answer is maybe, and, and I'm sure Mo and I can figure out someone who can answer that question directly mm -hmm. for you. Yeah, these are great questions. So yeah, if mm -hmm. there's something we don't know, we will definitely look into it and get back to you. Awesome. Um, okay, this next question comes from the Q&A box. Um, where does Raincoast stand on st stop fishing for salmon in BC? Hmm. Um, so Mo, I might hand this over to you, but I'll just add quickly that, um, so I said my, my broader PhD is about conflict, conservation conflict, so conflict that surrounds conservation measures. And a lot of the focus I have on that is conflict between people and wildlife, but another really key part of conservation conflict is conflict between people and people. Um, and so part of my PhD project is looking at conflict that we see between uh, recreational fishing angler groups and sort of conservation support or conservation organizations surrounding southern resident killer whale protection measures and sport fishing for salmon in bc so while i won't speak for where rainco stands on fishing for salmon in bc i will just mention the fact that just like when we think about why bears and humans end up in conflict part of my project is interested in looking at why people and people end up in conflict and not just because of sort of the superficial policy stuff so like disagreements on whether or not there should be salmon fishing in bc but the deep rooted aspects of that conflict so things like values experiences beliefs media identity um the complex things that are sometimes really hard to articulate that make us who we are and make conflicts much worse if they're not acknowledged um and so yeah, I think it's a, a complicated moment for that conversation, particularly with the pandemic going on. But as a, as a researcher, that's one conflict I'm interested in. And I'll also note that I think sort of the dichotomy between anglers or sports fishers and conservationists isn't necessarily real. This idea that those are two distinct groups, I think a lot of people are both. So yeah, it's something I'm also thinking about a lot right now. Mo, do you wanna add anything? Yeah, um, I mean, as Nate mentioned too in last episode, salmon is a foundation species in BC. So lots of species and lots of um, people rely on salmon or love eating salmon. And so one of the things is just being able to sustain the, the species for, for future generations, for, for the future. And so it's not ultimately trying to stop one group from um, being able to access salmon for the other, but just finding ways to, to be able to sustain this um, throughout the whole ecosystem. 
And so there are, for example, one of our focus projects and programs is um, recovering the southern resident killer whales. And if you join into our killer whale episode, you'll learn that Chinook salmon is their primary prey and food source. And so if you think about too what, what we eat, we have a whole variety of food sources that we can we can be able to access and eat. Whereas with the Southern Resident Killer Whales, that is their main food source. And so just all these different things come into the picture when you're considering these type of issues and, and conservation um, approaches. Uh, so the short answer is, is not is not a short answer. <laughs> There's lots to it, but like yeah, there'll be lots of uh, lots of more opportunities to discuss some of these things in our future episodes, where there will be one on wild salmon and killer whales, and so okay. yeah, there's lots of great um, learning opportunities coming up. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so maybe I'll do one or two more questions. Um, let's see. So when there's a human wildlife conflict, when someone is feeding a bear, for example. Is there any way to stop it effectively other than the wildlife ending up habituated or killed? It's a really good question. I, I've said that to every question, but they're all excellent. And um, it depends, I, I guess my answer would be. So one of the key concerns in avoiding human wildlife conflict is avoiding exactly that habituation, which is just when like those bears eating from the bird feeder, a bear at an early age gets used to finding really high quality nutrients in a setting that they shouldn't be in. So in your garbage can, in the fruit trees in your backyard. And like I said, for some people, that may not be an immediate problem. That might not be an immediate reason to be in conflict with that bear. But as soon as that bear ends up in someone else's yard, which bears, because they're not humans, don't see separations between people's yards, right? Um, or ends up in, in the same backyard, but new people have lived there, that can easily escalate into a conflict. So habituation is really dangerous for bears, as much as some of us would love to like hug black bears and feed them apples. Um, but as, as often um, Wild Safe BC, which is an organization that works on coexistence, will use the term of fed bear as a dead bear, which I'm, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. So is there any way to stop it effectively? There are some few and far between examples of conservation officers ca capturing a bear that has been in someone's yard that is habituated and relocating it and then having that bear um, not come back into town and so sort of successfully be re-released into the wild and not be a problem there. Another strategy to deal with some habituated bears that has been relatively successful is ca uh, conditioning. It's, it's sort of reconditioning bears. And it seems kind of unpleasant, but it is really important for the health of bears and people in the long term. And I've heard um, conservation officers and coexistence experts describe it as, they used to call it sort of harassment. So making really loud noises, making it really clear that the bear is not welcome in your backyard. Um, in the most extreme versions, it's things like non-lethal scaring the bear, so shooting things like rubber bullets or paintball guns at it, which is not a kind thing to do in the moment, but is a very kind thing to do in the long run if it keeps the bear out of uh, a human's backyard. And so what I've heard folks call it instead of harassment is simply communicating to the bear where it can be and where it can't be. So what you're saying, if you have a bear walk into your backyard or you see your neighbor feeding a bear and you get out and ring a cowbell or you know sound off an air horn or shoot a bear banger, is you're saying, bear, this is not a safe place for you to be. And that in the long term can lead to even a habituated bear sort of understanding that that place isn't safe. Because just like us, like if you guys have had a scary thing happen in a certain place or with a certain thing, you sort of have an association with that thing. Our brain does that for us. Fear is evolutionarily a very good tool. So you can condition a habituated bear to say, no, actually, this is not an okay place for you to be. This is a human space and it's not safe for you. So yes, you can effectively sort of recondition a habituated bear. No, it doesn't always work. Best case scenario is that the bear isn't habituated in the first place. But there are a ton of really good tools to like low, um, you know, electric fences, like fairly accessible ways to, to reteach bears what places are safe for them and what aren't. And I, I'm happy to send some links um, to that to Mo, but I think Raincoast has several up as well. So 
yes and no. Yes, yes and no. <laughs> Avoid habituated bears always mm -hmm. when you can. Definitely, yeah, there's mm -hmm. a lot to it when you encounter a bear in your backyard. Totally. Um, awesome. Well, I'm going to stop that stop here for today. Uh, if anyone does have any more questions, please feel free to send myself or, or Lauren your questions and we can get back to you then. Um, so Lauren launched her challenge for this week. And again, we are going to be taking those challenges in and then announcing a winner each week for each subsequent week's uh, challenge. So last week, Nate put out a challenge and I'll be announcing that in a second, but I just wanna thank again, Lauren, for joining us today and thank you all for joining us today. Now I'm gonna try to seamlessly uh, switch my computers because I need to share a screen. <laughs> there was a little minor glitch and I had to switch screens during the episode. So hopefully you didn't notice. I just but, want yeah. to say thanks really quickly to everyone. Lots of really, really excellent questions. Whoa, there's two Mo's now. <laughs> Crazy. Um, lots of excellent questions and lots of really kind words in the chat. And it's great to be connected to you guys this way when we're far apart. So thanks for everything you do. And thanks for tuning in. This was awesome. I really, really enjoyed it. And thank you, Mo. Oh, can't hear you. <laughs> Okay, good. Okay, awesome. So thank you again. Uh, and I am going to be sharing a screen with you. Hopefully everyone can see it. Oops, hold on. Okay. Okay, can everyone see my screen? All right, so last week we put out a challenge to send us three native species. And this week's winner is Tristan Hinder, who sent us three uh, species that he took a picture of. And so I'm just showing you the beautiful images he sent. So this one is of skunk cabbage. And let's see if we can see the next one, maybe. And then this one, Tristan, I think you put um, Christmas fern, but it looks to me like this could be deer fern. And feel free, anyone watching, to correct me if I'm wrong, just because it looks like the, the fronds are very rounded. So sometimes these ferns are really difficult to identify just because they all look very similar. And the last picture he shared with us is the Sitka spruce, which is a very common coastal tree. So thank you very much, Tristan. You are this week's winner, and we will send you an beautiful coastal carnivore image from our coastal carnivore collection um, and I will follow up with you to, to ask which one you want but you can check it out on our e-store on uh, www.raincoast.org so we'd love to hear your thoughts on this episode and if you want to send feedback please feel free to share it with me at Maureen dot raincoast oh marine at raincoast.org um, so if you want to learn more about these episodes and what's coming up feel free to check it out on our website at www.raincoast.org slash coastal uh, and feel free to follow us on any of our social media platforms um, on facebook instagram youtube and those are the different links to to join us so hopefully you enjoyed this episode again we will be filming it and putting it up on our website for everyone to view. And hopefully you can join us next week as we discuss more about bears and how they connect land and sea with our re research scientist from Rankos, Megan Adams. So hopefully everyone stay safe, stay motivated, stay wild, and I will see you guys next time. Goodbye. <laughs>